Okay, so um, the, the theme doesn't exist, except that um, I have been asked to talk about these three plays this year by different, various different people. And so I put them together and I realized that we've got a kind of early high period comedy, and then a high period tragedy, and then a very late romance. So we're, we're kind of an arc through Shakespeare's career. Uh, and we're going to start with Twelfth Night. Uh, and I want to begin by pointing out something about us, human nature, and human beings. And that is that we are somehow um, built to crave authenticity, reality, truth, the real thing. And depending on which religious tradition or civilization you ask, there are all kinds of explanations for why that is. Um, the only people who fundamentally disagree with that, I would say, um, are kind of modern, I don't know what to call them, religious leftist fanatics who believe in a utopian future, but not in any real human nature. And that comes out of the kind of existential idea that there's no such thing as human nature and, um, and so on. And there's a certain kind of scientism that also doesn't believe in, in human nature or truth as an, a, an eternal innate value. They value factuality in scientific study, but as far as ultimate truth goes, there's no such thing. There's just evolution and you know, what helps us to survive and so on. But in almost every other tradition, um, human beings are recognized to be made to crave truth and reality. And we can, uh, I can illustrate this just, if, if just, I mean, almost any way, but imagine that you're at a Sotheby's sale of two paintings and, the, and one is a copy of the other. And the copy is so good that the value of it, in terms of the money, is almost the same as the original, just because it's that good. And they're both for sale. So just ask yourself, which one do you want? And, and you know, it, it's obvious. We want the real one. We want the original one. We want the authentic one, not the copy, not the imitation, not the ersatz. Now, why that is, you have to go to these great traditions to tell us, but it's built into us. So because of this, we can distinguish between, in the, in the world of emotion, we can distinguish between what we call sentiment, which is a feeling in response to something real, a real feeling in response to something real, and sentimentality, which is the cultivation of the feeling for its own sake. So I'll give you a couple of examples of the difference. You all know the difference, but um, if, if you go to the vet and the vet says your dog has a serious uh, kidney ailment uh, and isn't long for the world, you feel sad, unless you hate the dog and then you may feel relieved. But in any case, you feel something real. Now, you could also decide that you want to feel, you want to have a good cry. So you go online and you open up a story about a poor suffering animal and you read the story and then that makes you cry and you feel like, oh good, I, that was a good cry. So in the first case, the, the, uh, the reality is you're actually responding with sentiment to the situation. And in the second case, you're cultivating the situation in order to evoke the sentiment. Anybody who says, I, I, just, I just need to have a good cry, <laughs> I mean, there may be physiological reasons for that, but not emotional ones. If, if you're really crying because something terrible has happened, that's sentiment. But if you're trying to think of something sad in order to have a good cry, that's sentimentality. So. I'm talking about this because Twelfth Night begins with a world called Illyria in which everybody is, except for one person, is 
caught in sentimentality. They're stuck, they're, they're inescapably bound by a kind of sentimental view of whatever the thing is. So I want to talk about the examples of that. Um, and the one exception to that in Illyria. Um, and then we're going to talk about the, how the structure of the play works in relation to this. So there are only two cures, we'll come back to this later, for sentimentality. Because we have this longing for authenticity in us, everything about our sentimental attachments or our, our self-indulgence in sentimentality is built on something false. And deep down we know it, but we, we don't uh, always, we are not always able to overcome it. We don't see it necessarily. And it's a question um, why human beings who have this deep longing for authenticity fall into the inauthenticity of sentimentality. Why is that? Is it Adam and Eve eating from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that plunges us into this temptation? Is it the devil at work in the world? Is it a failure of you know, genetic uh, development for, for the next few hundred thousand years until we get it right? What is it that allows us against our own deepest longing to fall into sentimentality and um, if we can't answer that, it's not so important, but we need to answer what gets us out of it. And so the play is going to show us that there are two, only two really ways out of it. And one is time and one is love of one kind or another. So that's, that, that remains to be examined, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I want to start with the beginning of the play, which begins with Orsino. And when I was young and I read this speech, I thought, ah, oh, how wonderful, like he really gets it. And that's the adolescent sentimental mind at work, right? So listen, if music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it, that surfeiting the appetite may sicken and so die. That strain again, they're playing music for it. It had a dying fall. Oh, it came o'er my ear like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odor. Enough, no more. Tis not so sweet now as it was before. Oh, spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou, that notwithstanding thy capacity receiveth as the sea, Naught enters there of what validity and pit soe'er, but falls into abatement and low price even in a minute. So full of shapes is fancy that it alone is high fantastical. Okay, well, this is very dreamy and musical and kind of longing and sweet, and, and he is hopeless, in fact. He is stuck. Well, how do we know this? If music be the food of love, play on, give me excess of it. So when Shakespeare tells, uh, shows us somebody asking for excess of anything, what do we know immediately? Something's wrong here. This is not okay, excess. Because Aristotle says, right, that uh, the golden mean is everything. Virtue depends on the golden mean. Not too much this, not too much the opposite. We are paradoxical beings. Uh, so pursuing excess is going to lead to payment, price. It's going to cost us. So what does he want excess of? <coughs> music. Give me excess of music. Overfeed me because music is the food of love. So I want to glut myself on the food of love. And so he wants the music. And then guess what? Oh, it's not so sweet now as it was before. Stop. I'm tired of this song. Well, later the, the uh, Festi is going to point out that Orsino's mind is a very opal, meaning he changes. He's, he's not constant. But what's the problem here? What's he in love with? Right. And not with... Not with her. So here's what he says. Um, will you go hunt, my lord? Curio says, let's get out of here and go do something. 
What? He says the heart, H-A-R-T. Why so I do, meaning H-E-A-R-T, right? You get the pun. The noblest that I have. Oh, when mine eyes did see Olivia first, methought she purged the air of pestilence. That instant was I turned into a heart, meaning a male deer, and my desires like fell and cruel hounds ere since pursue me. So it's the story of Actaeon who discovers um, Diana bathing in the woods and uh, his own dogs, and he turns to a stag, and she turns him to a stag because he has invaded her privacy, and she's a goddess, and she's the goddess of the hunt. So he turns into a stag and his own dogs hunt him down and kill him. And that's uh, Orsino's metaphor. I saw Olivia and now I'm a dead man because I'm so in love with her. What's he doing about it? Sitting around listening to music about it. <laughs> Not going to pursue her. Like an adolescent, exactly right. So let's turn to her for a second, because right here, Valentine uh, describes something about Olivia, and we find out that she also is in a state of sentimentality. How so? Valentine says, um, uh, Orsino says, what news from her? Valentine, do you see where I am? Act one, scene one, I'm about line 25, in case you want to follow along. So please, my lord, I might not be admitted, but from her handmaid do return this answer. The element itself till seven years heat, the element means the sun, seven years heat, so for seven years, shall not behold her face at ample view. She's not gonna go out, in the, out of the house in the sunlight for seven years. But like a cloistress, she will veiled walk and water once a day her chamber round with eye offending brine. Once a day, she's going to walk around her chamber and weep. I'm planning to go weep every day. <laughs> Why? All this to season a brother's dead love, meaning a dead brother's love, the love of a dead brother, which she would keep fresh and lasting in her sad remembrance. Now, you might feel this in the first week or months or year, but for seven years to plan to be in mourning. And of course, what that means is she's not going to be seen by any men. Now, how old is she? So let's say she's 20 or 21 or 22 or 18 or whatever she is. In seven years, she's pushing old maidhood in this time. And she doesn't have any prospect, but she wants to season a brother's dead love. That's, that's the woman that Orsino is in love with. Now, does he go pursue her? No. So now we're gonna skip ahead to, let me read a couple more things about Olivia. Um, in act one, scene two, uh, the captain says about her at line about 35 or so. She is the virtuous, a virtuous maid, the daughter of a count that died some 12 months since, then leaving her in the protection of his son, her brother, who shortly also died. For whose dear love, they say, she hath abjured the sight and company of men. So she's not only given up being seen by the son, the S-U-N, but she's given up being seen by men, any S-O-N, anybody's S-O-N. Okay, and then we get, uh, Sir Toby says it in Act 1, Scene 3, Line 1, what a plague means my niece to take of the death of her brother thus. I'm sure cares an enemy to life. So we, Toby has his own thing, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but He's right about her. She's wasting her life away in this kind of sentimental mourning. Okay. Um, in Act 1, Scene 5, back to Orsino for a minute. He 
he says to Cesario, which is Viola in disguise as a boy, we'll come back to Viola pretty soon, I have unclasped to thee, line 12, I have unclasped to thee the book even of my secret soul. Therefore, good youth, address thy gate unto her, go to Olivia, be not denied access, stand at her doors, and tell them there thy fixed foot shall grow till thou have audience. Be clamorous like those sirens. Leap all civil bounds rather than make unprofited return. What do you want me to tell her, says Cesario Viola. Unfold the passion of my love. Surprise her with, the discor with discourse of my dear faith. It shall become thee well to act my woes. She will attend it better in thy youth than in a nuncio's of more grave aspect. She's going to buy it from you because you're young and, and handsome. Uh, and I'm a little older, and so you're going you're gonna to sell the goods better than I can. Is this love? It's an idea of love, but it's a sentimental idea of love. It's, it's love as an emotion distinct from any real interaction between the people. Uh, I am myself, I, for I myself am best when least in company. Prosper well in this, and thou shalt live as freely as thy Lord to call his fortune thine. A kind of prefiguring comment, which we'll return to. All right, so who else is stuck in sentimentality, in Illyria? What is Sir Toby Belch all about? Cakes and ale. <laughs> Cakes and ale. Drinking. He's a drunk. He's an alcoholic. He's not exactly what we would call an alcoholic because they don't think of it as a disease. They think of it as a choice. But he's making this choice to be drunk all the time and celebrating all the time. Dancing and singing and making fun and being witty and, and keeping up to all hours and so on. Um, and who's his companion? Sir Andrew Aguecheek. What's his sentimentality. What does he think he's doing here in Illyria? Sir Andrew. Courting, Courting whom? Olivia. Okay, is there any chance in the world that she is going to pay him the least mind? No. Not only because he's tall and ague-like, and, but he's a hopeless idiot. I mean, he's a, he's a fool. He's a complete fool. He's got some money, and he's, he's got a title. How he got the title, we're not told, but it's certainly not from courage or uh, accomplishment. <laughs> so he's probably called what we would call a carpet knight. You know, you donate to the king, and then he makes you a knight. So that's Sir Andrew. And then finally, the great character of Malvolio. Malvolio, what's his name mean? Bad will. Bad will. Benevolence means willing the good. Malevolence means willing the bad. So he's got bad will. But what, what's his sentimentality? What's he, what's he caught in like these, these ones? So the first example is um, Act 1, Scene 5. Look at line about 78 or so. He's talking about uh, the fool, Festi. And we'll come back to Festi. I marvel your ladyship takes delight in such a barren rascal. I saw him put down the other day with an ordinary fool that has no more brain than a stone. Look you now, he's out of his guard already. Unless you laugh and minister occasion to him, he is gagged. I protest I take these wise men, like you, Olivia, that crow so at these set kind of fools, like Festi, no better than the fool's zanies. Right? The, the uh, Commedia dell'arte character who's just like a, your, your sidekick dummy who does whatever you want them to do. All right, so he's, got, he's kind of full of himself, yes? So this comes to a complete elaborate development um, in Act 2, Scene 3. Um, let's say about line... Oh, no, not, not full development. We're, we're still on the way there. Um, 
They're singing and dancing and screaming, Sir Toby and Sir Andrew and Mariah. And he comes in and he says at line about 80, my masters, are you mad or what are you? Have you no wit, manners, nor honesty, but to gabble like tinkers at this time of night? Do you make an alehouse of my lady's house? He's not completely wrong about what they're doing, but Notice how full of himself he is. Sir Toby, I must be round with you. My lady bade me tell you that though she harbors you as her kinsman, she's nothing allied to your disorders. If you can separate yourself and your misdemeanors, you are welcome to the house. If not, and it would please you to take leave of her, she is very willing to bid you farewell. Of course, he's not telling him to go. He can't. He's, he's beneath him in the hierarchy. You all remember my talking about hierarchy. You don't remember, but I'll give you a short version. Shakespeare's world is hierarchical, not egalitarian. It's not Darwin's everybody fighting for the same food and light and water and so on. It's a hierarchical universe from God to, the, to brute matter, and everybody's got a place in that hierarchy. And Virtue means knowing your place, being obedient to those above, and being caring of or caring for those below. You are responsible for those who depend on you, and you are responsible to those who are above you. And, and then that goes along with the doctrine of correspondence. Um, I know I remind you of this every year, that any level of that hierarchy corresponds in metaphor to any other level. So if I want to talk about um, disorder in the universe, I might use as a metaphor Lucifer rebelling against God. Or I might use an earl rebelling against the duke or the king. Or I might use a son rebelling against a father. Or I might use, as uh, Shakespeare does in the Scottish play, um, a mousing owl attacking and killing a hawk. A mousing owl attacking and killing a hawk. That's everything upside down, a metaphor for killing the king. So th this, this uh, world of possible metaphors of all of these different levels of the hierarchy fills Shakespeare's imagination and, and it, it makes um, his language rich. So uh, Malvolio has to say if it would please you to go because he can't tell him to go. He's a steward. He's beneath him in the hierarchy. A knight is higher. On the other hand, he's full of himself. And he's, you know, with that little adjustment, he's telling Malvolio what to do and what he needs to do. All right, let's go to uh, Act 2, Scene 5. I know I'm going to skip around, but that's to get to my theme. Um, Act two, scene five, line about uh, yes. Say line thirty-two. They're hiding, right? Sir Toby and Sir Andrew and uh, Fabian are hiding behind the bushes, and Mariah has planted this letter to trick Malvolio. I'm assuming you've all read the play or seen it recently. OK, so they, hear, they overhear him talking to himself. And th the first thing we hear is he says, to be Count Malvolio. Now, there's no way he's going to be a Count Malvolio except by marrying Olivia, who's a countess. So he's then promoted. But he's imagining being a count. There's, it's, it's not going to happen. It's not reality. It's not the real painting. It's the fake painting. To be Count Malvolio. There's example for it. And he gives one that's kind of a, takes a long footnote. Um, Having been three months married to her, sitting in my state, meaning on his throne, calling my officers about me in my branched velvet gown, having come from a daybed where I have left Olivia sleeping. And of course, Toby is ready to bop him on the head with rage for this pretense. And then to have the humor of state. And after a demure travel of regard, that is, I'm going to look around the room like this. Telling them, I know my place as I would they should do theirs. 
I am going to enjoy telling them, I know my place and you should know your place. Well, in saying this, what's he doing? Yeah, no, and no, the opposite. He's pretending to a place that he, he doesn't have. He doesn't know his place in his imagination, right? He's pretending to be Count Malvolio. I know my place as Count Malvolio. Well, the irony is, of course, he's making it all up. He's not anything like Count Malvolio. Okay, so he goes on. Um, to ask for my kinsman Toby, seven of my people with an obedient, seven of my people with an obedient start make out for him. I frown the while and perchance wind up my watch or play with my, and then he's about to say chain. Why? Because he's wearing a chain which symbolizes his office as steward of the countess's household. Like he's in charge of the servants. And then he suddenly realizes, oh no, I'm imagining being Count Malvolio. I won't have a steward's chain. So then he switches suddenly. That's what that dash means. Some rich jewel. You get what I'm saying? He's, he can't, he almost forgets within the fantasy. He almost goes back to who he really is with this chain. Oh no, it's some rich jewel. I extend my hand to him, thus quenching my familiar smile with an austere regard of control. Toby on the side says, doesn't Toby take you a blow of the lips then? My fortunes having cast me on your knees, give me this prerogative of speech, etc. So here's the essence of Malvolio's sentimentality, right? He's imagining himself to be this exalted figure. Okay, now there is one character in uh, Illyria, who is not a sentimentalist. That is, he's not subject to this kind of self-delusion, this fantasizing. And that is Festi. He's the critic. And he is, in a sense, the voice of wisdom in the play. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. But first, I want to clarify something, which I only finished clarifying to myself this morning. I woke up and I thought, is Festy ever called a clown in the play? And I looked and the answer is no. He's called a clown in the stage direction. What is a clown for Shakespeare? A bumpkin, a kind of ignorant country fool usually. Um, like William in As You Like It is a clown. But the term gets fuzzed together with the idea of fool or folly often. Um, Hamlet says, let the clown say no more than is set down for him. He doesn't necessarily mean the fool. He probably means the country bumpkin character in a play. Um, and in As You Like It, Touchstone is called the clownish fool. So there's a kind of overlap there. But in Festi, though he's called the clown in the stage directions, he's never called the clown in the play. He's called the fool. And that's because the whole point, the whole thrust of the character of Festi is this paradoxical relation between folly and wisdom. The, the folly of the wise, the folly of the people who, know, who think they know what they're doing, and the wisdom of the fool, who really does know what he's doing, even though he's not among the so-called wise, what we would call the educated or the elite. So I'm going to give you some examples of his corrective language, um, which suggests what his role is. Act 1, scene 5, line 24 and 5. He's talking to Mariah, and they're having a kind of verbal play back and forth. And he says, finally, well, go, that's a good joke, very apt. He says to her, well, go thy way. If Sir Toby would leave drinking, thou wert as witty a piece of Eve's flesh as any in Illyria. This is Shakespeare. This is Shakespeare being allusive and clever. He's not saying if you would only, if Sir Toby would only leave drinking, he'd make a good husband and you'd make him a good wife. That's what he means. But he says, if he would leave drinking, thou wert as witty a piece of Eve's flesh. In other words, you're witty enough to hang out with a knight and have a conversation and have some real relationship there. What's the problem? 
Toby is drinking. He doesn't even recognize, he doesn't even come to his senses enough to realize that what he should be doing is marrying Mariah. So the, the, the fool knows this, Festi knows this, recognizes it. Again, line 46. Um, he's speaking to Olivia, and he's just about to go into this catechism of Olivia, which is one of the great delights of the play. Um, she says to him at line 36, go to, you are a dry fool, I'll know more of you. Besides, you grow dishonest. So we're talking about honesty and truth, right? Two false Madonna that drink and good counsel will amend. Forgive the dry fool drink. So you are a dry fool means you're dull, you're boring, you don't have wit. Give the dry fool drink, then is the fool not dry? He's punning, right? He's not thirsty. You're, you are a, you are a not witty fool, well, give me drink and I won't be thirsty. It's the same word, dry. Bid the dishonest man mend himself. So you give the dry fool drink, he won't be dry. And as for being dishonest, bid the honest man mend himself, correct himself. If he cannot, i sorry, if he mend, he is no longer dishonest. So you give him a chance to correct himself. If he corrects himself, he's no longer dishonest. So you would cure me by telling me what I should do. If he cannot, let the botcher mend him. Botcher is a person who uh, mends torn clothing by sewing in pieces of cloth. Anything that's mended is but patched. Virtue that transgresses is but patched with sin. And sin that amends is but patched with virtue. Okay, so this sounds kind of silly and superficial and quick-witted and blah, 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 but in fact, if you think about it, it's a very profound idea. No human being is without need for mending. We're all fallen, we're all sinners, we're all fallible. And when we repent, we are patching ourselves. We become not perfect, just mended. So even virtuous people are patched with sin. They've got some flaws. <clears throat> and vice versa, even the, most, um, even the most sinful has some virtue. Being a human being, he's given powers and virtues as a human being. So virtue that transgresses is but patched with sin. If you're virtuous generally <coughs> and you transgress, the, the sin doesn't take away all your virtue, it just blots it. And sin that amends is but patched with virtue. You're still a sinner, you, you've amended yourself, you've repented, let's say, you've resolved not to behave like that anymore, but that doesn't make you a perfect, flawless human being. It just patches you up. If that this simple syllogism will serve, so, meaning fine. If it will not, what remedy? And then he says, it's, it's one of the hardest lines in the play, and it's, it's maybe the most important line, for, at least for Olivia. As there is no true cuckold but calamity, so beauty's a flower. As there is no true cuckold but calamity, so beauty's a flower. What does this mean? So, you have to give the word true its full weight. What is a cuckold? A man whose wife is unfaithful to him. This is symbolized by his having horns on his head, right? Which everyone can see but himself. So everyone in the room knows that his wife is unfaithful, but he doesn't. And everyone sees horns on his head and nobody else sees it. Do you know those, the, when the kids take a group photo and they do this to their neighbor? It, it means I'm sleeping with this guy's wife and he doesn't know it. They call it bunny ears, but they don't know where it comes from. So uh, uh, there's no good, such thing as a good cuckold, right? It's a bad thing to be. <laughs> but there's one true cuckold. There's one cuckold that is what he should be. 
namely calamity. In other words, you, you should make a cuckold of calamity. You should not allow calamity to be a husband. You have to divorce and uh, abandon this calamity. So the only, it's, it's not good to make anybody a cuckold, but it's good to make calamity a cuckold and go off with someone else. In other words, Olivia should abandon her marriage to calamity and go off with a real man and skip all this fake sorrowing for her brother for seven years. She should make a cuckold of calamity. Yeah. Where was that? Um, Where's the line? It's act one, scene five, line 47 or so. It's depending on your edition. It's the end of that the long paragraph of, the, of uh, Festi. And then he says, so be, as, this is as so, so it's analogy. As <clears throat> there's no true cuckold but calamity, so beauty's a flower. What does that mean? It fades. It fades fast. And he's telling her, look, you're young and beautiful now. You're marriageable. You have a potential for being happy. But if you wed yourself to calamity, your beauty is going to go away and th that'll be it. You won't be happy ever. So make a cuckold of calamity. That's a true cuckold. And recognize beauty's a flower and get over yourself. Get over this sentimentality. And then he says, I say again, take her. I'm just going to read this because it's so much fun. I say again, take her away. Sir, I bade them take away you, meaning I said, take the fool away. He says, misprision in the highest degree. Lady Cucullus non facit monachum. The cowl doesn't make the monk. You may think I'm a fool on the outside, but that doesn't mean I'm foolish on the inside. That's as much as to say I wear not motley in my brain. Motley is the dress of the fool. The court fool, multicolored clothing. Give me leave to prove you a fool. Can you do it? Dexterously, good Madonna. Make your proof. I must catechize you for it, Madonna. I'm going to ask you questions, and you're going to give me the automatic answers, as in the Catholic Church catechism, which is how they educate children. <laughs> Well, sir, for want of other idleness, I'll bide your proof. Good Madonna, why mournst thou? Good fool for my brother's death. I think his soul is in hell, Madonna. Otherwise, why would you be mourning for him? I know his soul is in heaven, fool. Clown, or Festi. The more fool, Madonna, to mourn for your brother's soul being in heaven. Take away the fool, gentlemen. All right, now how can he get away with talking like this? When we saw that Malvolio couldn't get away with just telling Sir Toby, his superior, what to do. Here's the fool, the lowest in the court, in her household, telling the lady that she's a fool and let the servants take her away. It's, a, it's all a metaphor, of course. Well, he's called an allowed fool. He's permitted to be witty and criticize because like every good king, he needs somebody to tell him the truth. Right? He needs somebody to tell him what's really going on and, and not be afraid. So that's called the allowed fool, and that's what he is. In fact, she said to Malvolio, um, let me see, I, I think it was one five, uh, where was it? Um, Sixty-four. No, that's where I am. But I, there's a place where she says to Malvolio, "There's no, there's nothing wrong with an allowed fool." Here it is. There is no slides line. Um, it's one five line eighty-eight. There is, or in, in my edition, there is no slander in an allowed fool, though he do nothing but rail, nor no railing in a known discreet man, though he do nothing but reprove. So if the fool is allowed, it's not slander. You can't slander a prince. You're not allowed to accuse a prince of anything. 
It's uh, long before what we call freedom of speech. They didn't have freedom of speech and they didn't believe in freedom of speech because you couldn't say negative things about the prince. It, it was a punishable offense. And rightly so from their point of view, because somebody who's slandering a prince is going to throw the realm into chaos and conflict and destruction and rebellion and so on. And then everybody suffers. So, but if he's an allowed fool, there's no slander in him, even if he's railing at everybody all the time. And if a, known, if, the, if a man is a known discreet man, he can reprove all he wants. You're not going to um, call it railing because it's, he's not just yelling at you to yell at you. He's correcting you. So this is her defense of Festi. She sees that Festi is actually wise. And after this little exchange, um, the more fool Madonna to mourn for your brother's soul being in heaven. What think you of this fool, Malvolio, doth he not mend? So she gets what he's doing, but she can't change with this. It's not enough. What Festi says is not enough. Okay, um, let's go on with Festi a little bit. Uh, Act 2, scene 4. Okay, this is where he's talking to... Um, Orsino, Festi is. He's come and he's been singing a song for Orsino. And it's the kind of thing that or we heard in the beginning, music be the food of love, make me, make me longing and miserable by hearing this music. And the song is, come away, come away, death. Come, death, take me. I'm slain by a fair, cruel maid. Everybody weep over me. Don't flow, throw flowers. No, don't, let's not have any friends at my funeral. Just throw me out where sad true lover may, never may find my grave. Okay. He says, boo-hoo, boo-hoo, weep, weep. I'm so miserable she won't have me. Then he pays Festi for singing. And Festi says at line 72, Now the melancholy God protect thee, and the tailor make thy doublet of changeable taffeta, for thy mind is a very opal. I would have men of such constancy put to sea, that their business might be everything and their intent everywhere, for that's it that always makes a good voyage of nothing. So he's nailing him, <laughs> although it, it may not be that Orsino notices it. He doesn't give any attention to it. Um, He's melancholy because he's choosing to be. He thinks his clothes should be, his doublet should be made of changeable taffeta, you know, that sort of iridescent material that reflects the light in different colors. So it's, you don't know what color it is, like it's always changing. Thy mind is a very opal, again, ch color changing kind of gem, depending on how you turn it, it looks different. Uh, I would have men of such constancy, meaning no constancy, put to sea, their, that their business might be everything in their intent everywhere. That's, people like you, that's what they do. They go to sea, they go everywhere. And they do, and that always makes a good voyage of nothing. So the, of nothing has several layers of meaning. You make something out of nothing, but it's the opposite. You, you make the voyage worth nothing, because you've gone everywhere to do everything. You don't accomplish anything anywhere. Okay, so that's his critique of Orsino. Um, in 3.1, let's see. 3.1 at 37 and following, let's say. Uh, Viola says to him, I saw thee late at the Count Orsino's, and he says, foolery, sir, does walk about the orb like the sun. It shines <laughs> everywhere. Everybody, fool, foolishness is general. Wherever you go, there's going to be folly, okay? I would be sorry, sir, but the fool should be as oft with your master as with my mistress. Um, I, I would be sorry if the fool didn't attend to your master as often as I attend to my mistress, meaning <clears throat> they're equally foolish, and they both need me, <laughs> the wise fool, to wake them up. And then he says to her, I, or it, he thinks it's him, 
because a vial is dressed as Caesarea. I think I saw your wisdom there. Wisdom, meaning the opposite of foolishness. And she says, whoa, don't start working on me. I know what you're up to. No. So he leaves her alone, sort of. Um, and then at line 60, uh, where am I? 3160. This fellow is wise enough, says Viola, to play the fool. And to do that well craves a kind of wit. He must observe their mood on whom he jests, the quality of persons and the time, and like the haggard, check at every feather that comes before his eye. This is a practice as full of labor as a wise man's art. For folly that he wisely shows is fit. But wise men, folly fallen, quite taint their wit. The wise fool is doing a difficult task, and it's a valuable one. The, the wa supposedly wise man who's fallen into folly is tainting his own wit. All right. So all of this is fine. We've got all these sentimentalists, and we've got Festy kind of needling at them and giving us really the voice of wisdom in the play. And it doesn't do any good. He cannot solve it. He can't reach them. So what does? Into this world of sentimentality, there is an invasion. And it's an invasion of two twins and a sea captain, or not a sea captain, but a, a, a pirate, not exactly a pirate. He's a good guy, Antonio. Anyway, Viola uh, first, and then Sebastian and Antonio come to shore totally by accident, not by plan, and not by intention, but totally in the hands of the gods, or God, or the fates, or whatever it is. And who are they? They are people who have really lost everything as far as we know and as far as they know. The father's dead. The ship is wrecked. She thinks the brother's dead. Maybe not. He thinks the sister's dead. Maybe not. And they are washed ashore, and they've got to make the best of their life. And so what happens is they enter the lives of these sentimentalists with something real. And it converts everything. It transforms everything. So. Let's look at them when they arrive and see who they are by contrast. In Act 1, Scene uh, 2, Viola lands in Illyria with the captain and sailors. And the first thing she says, he says, this is Illyria lady. She says, what should I do in Illyria? My brother, he is in Elysium, meaning in heaven. And then she stops. Perchance he is not drowned. She's not going to do what Olivia does. Oh, my brother is drowned. I'm going to weep and weep and weep for seven years and hide myself. She says, maybe he's not drowned. What think you? It is perchance that you yourself were saved. Oh, my poor brother, and so perchance may he be. So she's got hope, first of all. Then he says, to comfort you, I saw him swimming ashore. I think he's probably uh, like Orion on the dolphin's back. As long as I could see, he was above the waves, so he wasn't drowning. <clears throat> she gives him gold. Mine own escape unfoldeth to my hope, whereto thy speech serves for authority, the like of him. By the way, that's a comma there, if, if your edition doesn't have one. My own escape unfoldeth to my hope, comma, whereto thy speech serves for authority, comma, the like of him. I, you're giving me hope that because I was saved, maybe he was saved. So she's got hope. Then um, she wants to serve that lady, but she's not going to do it. She will admit no kind of suit. So she decides to dress up as a boy, looking exactly like her brother, with the same clothes, and she's going to be presented as an eunuch to the Duke Orsino and sing to him and try to be a good servant. 
for I can sing and speak to him in many sorts of music that will allow me very worth his service. And then she says this, line 60, what else may hap to time I will commit. Only shape thou thy silence to my wit. I'm going to let time do whatever it has to do. I, all I'm going to try to do is save myself, get a job, right? Disguise myself in order to protect myself from bad men and see what happens. Okay, so now go to, <clears throat> so she's got not only hope, but patience. What is patience, literally, in Shakespeare's world? There's a deponent verb in Latin, it's patior. Deponent means it takes the passive form of the verb, but it's an active verb. So it means to bear, or to put up with, or to suffer, that is being willing to suffer. That's what patience is. The willingness to bear whatever you have to bear. And, that, and she's demonstrating this. <clears throat> now go to two, uh, Act 2, Scene 2, Line 39. Act 2, Scene 2, Line 39. Um, do you remember that <clears throat> Olivia seems to be falling in love with the boy that Viola is pretending to be? Why is Olivia falling in love with this boy? Because he shows up. <laughs> he shows up and he says, here's what I would say if I were in love with you, blah, 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 blah. We'll read some of it pretty soon. Uh, and she goes, oh, you would do a lot. And, and Viola keeps saying, this is how my master loves you. And she goes, forget your master. You're here, like you're saying this. You're the one that jazzes me up. Okay, so um, <laughs> she's chased. Uh, uh, Olivia sends a ring with Malvolio to give to Cesario. And Viola has this great speech. Um, I left no ring with her. So I'm going to read this speech because it's, it's fabulous. Do you see where I am? It's Act 2, Scene 2, Line uh, 16. I left no ring with her. What means this lady? Fortune forbid my outside have not charmed her. She made good view of me, indeed so much that as me thought her eyes had lost her tongue, for she did speak in starts distractedly. She loves me, sure. The cunning of her passion invites me in this churlish messenger, that's Malvolio. None of my lord's ring? Why, he sent her none. I am the man. If it be so, as tis, poor lady, she were better love a dream. Disguise, she looks at her own disguise as a boy. I see thou art a wickedness wherein the pregnant enemy, meaning the devil, does much. How easy is it for the proper false in women's waxen hearts to set their form. It's very easy in women's hearts for a good outside to set its form, for, for, a, for a, a nicely presented externality to seduce the lady. We're in act two, scene two, the last speech. I'm at about line 29, 30. You got it? Two, two. In women's wax and hearts to set their forms. Alas, our frailty is the cause, not we. For such as we are made of, such we be. We're women after all. How will this fadge? How's this gonna work out? My master loves her dearly, and I, poor monster, because she's dressed up like a boy, fond as much on him. 
And she, mistaken, seems to dote on me. So we have this tr uh, trilogy, this trinity of A loves B, B loves C, C loves A, and there's no resolution possible. What will become of this? As I am man, my state is desperate for my master's love. That is, I don't have any hope of winning my master's love because I'm dressed as a boy. As I am woman, now alas the day, what thriftless sighs shall poor Olivia breathe? She's going to sigh away uselessly for this boy who isn't a boy. O oh, time, thou must untangle this, not I. It is too hard a knot for me to untie. And there's that humility again. Time, I can't do this. You're going to have to figure this out. All right, who else invades? Sebastian, Act 2, Scene 1. Sebastian, Antonio has saved Sebastian from the sea. <clears throat> they land in Illyria, where Antonio's an enemy because he ran into trouble with the Duke a while back. And so it's dangerous for him to walk around. And Sebastian doesn't want to involve him in his bad fortune. So he says, go away and leave me. And Antonio can't do that because he loves him too much. I perceive in you so excellent a touch of modesty that you will not extort from me what I'm willing to keep in. Therefore, it charges me in manners to rather, the rather to express myself. So I haven't been telling you the truth. Here's who I really am. You must know of me then, Antonio, line 14. My name is Sebastian, which I called Roderigo. My father was that Sebastian of Messaline, whom I know you have heard of. He left behind him myself and a sister, both born in an hour. So they're fraternal twins. If the heavens had been pleased, would we had so ended. I wish I had died when she did. But you, sir, altered that. For some hour before you took me from the breach of the sea was my sister drowned. Alas, the day. A lady, sir, though it was said she much resembled me. Now, you know, in modern movies, you can make people up to look pretty much identical if you want to. It's pretty hard to do that on Shakespeare's stage, but you didn't need to because they didn't go to see a play. They went to hear a play. Remember this? Let's go hear a play. <clears throat> the play exists in the words that they're speaking. The costumes, they get as elaborate as they can. There's not much makeup, there's some. Um, and sets, very minimal. But whatever it is, if there's a tree here, and I, we say, now I am in the forest of Arden, everybody sees that you're now in the forest of Arden. Why? Because the words are saying it, and that's where the play lives. So my sister much resembled me. Okay, we buy it. That's it. We, you've told us you look alike. That's okay. We're going to now believe this. And of course, they're going to dress in identical clothes. So that reinforces it. And it doesn't matter if her face is like this and his, hers. I should say his, because of course, all the actors were boys. So Viola is a, a boy actor playing the girl, Viola playing the boy, Cesare. <clears throat> we'll talk about gender bending in a minute for a little while. Um, so he says, uh, she is drowned already with salt water, though I seem to drown her remembrance again with more. He's, he's going to weep again over his, the death of his sister. If you will not murder me for my love, let me be your servant. That is, if you don't want to kill me by refusing me, let me serve you. And Sebastian says, if you will not undo what you have done, that is, kill him whom you have recovered, desire it not. And he says, I I'm, I'm, want to be kind to you, and therefore, um, don't stick with me. It's not good for you. But I'm going to Orsino's court, farewell. And he leaves. And then Antonio has this wonderful speech. The gentleness of all the gods go with thee. I have many enemies in Orsino's court. Else would I very shortly see thee there. Uh, it's dangerous for me to be in this place. Otherwise, I'd follow you no matter what. But then he changes his mind. But come what may, I do adore thee so, the danger shall seem sport, and I will go. 
He's real. He cares about Sebastian. We're going to talk about that relationship in a minute. And he follows him in, into the teeth of danger because there, he cares about him in a real way. This is not sentimentality. This is not imagination. This is not fancy. This is reality. This is real feeling and devotion. Okay, let's just follow Antonio for a minute more. And um, let's see. Uh, 3 4, Act 3, Scene 4, line 292. Um, <clears throat> he comes upon Viola, dressed as Cesario, who looks exactly like Sebastian, fighting. Sir Andrew, in that fake battle. And he stops it. He, he jumps in. At, I'm at Act 3, Scene 4, Line 2, whatever it is, 290-something. Um, 292. Put up your sword, he says. If this young gentleman have done a... F he thinks it's Sebastian, and we know it's Viola. If this young gentleman have done offense, I take the fault on me. If you offend him, for him I defy you. So if he's done something wrong, blame me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if he's done something wrong, blame me. And if, if you've done wrong to him, I'm going to fight you. And then Sir Toby steps in and so on. All right, so he's willing to fight. And then at 339, in the same scene, he says... Let me speak a little. So Viola says, I don't know you. I mean, I don't know why you're doing this. And I'm really glad that you stopped this fight. But I don't have your money. And I don't know what you're talking about. And Antonio says, let me speak a little. This youth that you see here, I snatched one half out of the jaws of death, relieved him with such sanctity of love. And to his image, which me thought did promise most venerable worth, did I devotion. But oh, how vile and idle proves this God. Think of Orsino's having the mind of an opal, changeable, right? He thinks that that's what's happened to Sebastian. Thou hast, Sebastian, done good feature shame. You know, it is you're handsome and you've, you're, ashamed, you're shaming your good looks by behaving badly. In nature, there's no blemish but the mind. None can be called deformed but the unkind. Virtue is beauty, but the beauteous evil are empty trunks or flourished by the devil. So we're talking about the inside and the outside, the reality and the look. Um, in the end of Aisha's Chayil, the last two lines are, can you call them to mind? Sheker, Anyway, Chain, now that I want it, it's... it's Sheker ha-chain ve-hevel ha-yofi. Uh, beauty is vain, but a good woman, she should be praised. So that's in Proverbs uh, 31. And he's saying the same thing. The outside isn't what matters. The, the virtuous soul is what matters. Okay. So this is Antonio's passion of disappointment in the betrayal by this person who, to whom he's devoted. All right, what do these people do in Illyria? Um, maybe I should take a little break. Do, do people want a break? Do you want a uh, water, bathroom break, anything, a few minutes? Yes, no? You're really ready to keep going? I'm fine. I can go on like a... Yeah, my back's fine. I can go, I can go like, like a mule forever, all day, carrying the burden. No, it's fun. OK, so, so what is happening here? What is happening is that the sentimentalists are suddenly confronted with real people. And they cannot help falling in love with them. So Olivia falls in love with Cesario, who is really Viola. So she's not a real person. It's an illusion at one level, but it's not really an illusion. Because what captivates Olivia by, about Viola, dressed as Cesario, is her 
sincerity, her honesty, her truth, her virtue, her, her reality. She just rings true. Orsino never rang true to her. That's why she couldn't love him. I can't love him, she kept saying at the beginning. And the same thing happens to Orsino, because there's this boy, he thinks, Cesario, listening to him, understanding him, arguing with him, talking to him, and they share their inner lives. And he comes to love this boy. And, it's, and he feels betrayed like Antonio when he discovers that this boy has secretly married the, the girl he thinks he's in love with. And all it takes is for Sebastian to appear at the very end and, and, and the disguise to be revealed for Olivia to, to be thrilled that she's married Sebastian and not a girl and, and um, for Orsino to be thrilled that he's in love with this actual girl who is heart in heart with him, even though dressed as a boy. All right, so let's talk about um, gender for a little bit. Uh, because we're living in an age of such utter nonsense um, that this play suffers from, from that nonsense. Not as badly as some plays do, but. So you will see in almost every production, and I've had this fight with directors, <clears throat> Antonio portrayed as an unrequited gay lover. Why else would he do this for Sebastian? Why else would he be so upset? Why else would he follow him wherever he goes? And it is because we are the victims of the age of Freud in which we've been told that every strong passion that we have is a sexual one. Now, I'm not denying that every strong passion we have has or may have an erotic or a sexual element in it, but that's not the same thing. It's not the same thing as seeing every passion and every love and every attachment as a sublimation of sex. So I'm going to do a little work to prove this to you, um, although you're shaking your head, so you already know that I'm right. But uh, I just like to do this I I've, I've do this for my students, too, and it sometimes comes as a shock to them. If you think back to when you were a child, let's say prepubescent, right? Like 9, 10, 11, 12, maybe. And you had a best friend of your same gender. If you were lucky, you were utterly glommed on to each other. You couldn't bear to be parted. You would walk your friend home, and then your friend would walk you home, and then you'd walk your friend home. Can so-and-so stay over? Please, 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 can so-and-so stay? Can I stay over? We're going there. No, I want so-and-so to go with me. Can, can they have dinner tonight? I, I, we can't be separated. It hurts to be separated. So uh, many of my students know this and have experienced it, and then I say, was this attachment sexual? Ew, no, of course not. It wasn't even a distant thought in the mind or the body. There was nothing like that going on. Was it romantic? Yes. Was it passionate? Yes. Was it needy? Absolutely. Can't live without this person. So this is love. This is intense, powerful, romantic, but not sexual love. And Shakespeare knew that this was a reality, and he inherited the idea of it, particularly male friendship of this kind, although he gives us plenty of female friends like the cousins in As You Like It, um, Celia and Rosalind. But here, it's particularly male friendship he's talking about. There's a long classical history of this. Cicero wrote a whole, a uh, book on amikitia, uh, about friendship, and what does it mean, and how high a form of love it is, precisely because it isn't sexual, and therefore isn't possessive, but is self-sacrificial and so on. And of course, Jesus made a whole 
of uh, religion out of uh, friendship, agapic love, the love of your neighbor and the love of even the enemy with this selfless, imitating divine love. So what happens on the modern stage when they give us an Antonio that is simply an unrequited sexual lover is that we are robbed of an image of friendship, an image of true love and passion that isn't sexual when we need it badly because we don't see it in our movies, we don't see it in, on our television, we don't, we don't see it anywhere, we don't see it, we see it only undermined. Wherever it starts to poke its head, you get embarrassment and apologies. Uh, and, and then this mangles masculinity and it mangles the relation between men uh, and it, it's just, it's a destructive poison. And of course, it works on the, uh, in the opposite way too. That is, um, it, it ruins the relations between women and also between women and men because, um, it, because a woman who has, who is related or loves a man who has this kind of friend is now tempted to be jealous as if there were something erotic and sexual in it when there isn't. And so you get all kinds of friction about, you know, can he go off with the guys for the weekend? And, uh, and of course, in our culture, going off with the guys for the weekend isn't about the relation between, often, between Antonio and Sebastian. It's like going off with the guys for the weekend to prove that they're masculine and then they have to get laid with the prostitutes and they have to get drunk and ruin their lives. And, and she's right to be suspicious and worried about. Okay, all of this is a function of the impoverishment of our imagination and our relation to the capacity of human beings to love romantically and passionately, not necessarily sexually. Of course, that kind of passion can become sexual, and that's what happens here. So here's Olivia falling for Viola, thinking it's Cesario, right? But what she's falling in love with is not the sexuality, the male sexuality of this person. There isn't any. She's falling in love with the person. And because Viola is like her brother, and her brother is virtuous as she is, when it turns out that, that Sebastian <laughs> appears, and, Viola, and uh, uh, Olivia can't tell the difference, so she goes and grabs him. The minute he's willing to go, she grabs him and takes him off to marry him. And he goes, okay, okay, this is fine. I mean, this, this is better than I could have hoped for. Um, she is rewarded by that love for the person in the person of Sebastian, who is not only that person that is genuine and real and virtuous, but also male. So she can actually marry him, have children, and live happily ever after, instead of wasting away uh, in mourning for her brother. And the same with Orsino on the other side. Uh, he falls in love with the person of this boy, supposed boy, because they're sharing their hearts and they're talking. And when he finds out it's really a girl, then he thinks, you know, I, I really love this person. I, that was all uh, fantasy about Olivia because it was her body I was in love with. I, I don't think I read this to you. Um, Orsino says, uh, It's two, it's maybe one, four. Let me find the place. Uh, no, I, I'm not gonna find it right now. He says, it's not, I'm not, I'm not a light-hearted, loose guy. I really love Olivia because her body is so beautiful. You know, it's, that, it's, it's the, the form that nature pranks her in, he says, that captivates me. I don't care about her land, I don't care about her riches, it's her beauty, it's her physical beauty. Well, that's equally 
superficial compared to what he really feels for Cesario Viola. And when he discovers that this is not only his closest heart's you know, relation, but also a girl, great. So we have, a, we have redemption from his sentimental fantasy, his dream. So, and then, of course, Anto uh, uh, Antonio is vindicated because when it turns out that it wasn't Sebastian at all who betrayed him, but it was, it was the illusion because there's Viola dressed as Cesario who looks like Sebastian. So then, oh my goodness, it's okay. He really was a true friend. It, there, wasn't, there wasn't the betrayal. The inner, I was right about the inner life of Sebastian and their friendship is, remains uh, intact. Okay, I'm going to stop for a minute and take questions because the next thing I want to do is talk about uh, the title of the play and that, that'll, be, that'll take me a while. So ask me questions up till now. You get my point. My main point is there's this Illyria of sentimentality and there's this invasion of Illyria by real people. And the sentimentalists can't help being converted. They cannot help f falling in love with the real ones. What? <laughs> oh, go ahead. Uh, you, you keep talking about my book that says Mar, Mar, Maria or Maria? Mariah. It doesn't say, you keep telling your Caesarea? Caesario is the name that Viola takes when she dresses up oh, as a boy. Okay. That's what I mean by Viola Cesario. I keep saying that. Because she's dressed up as a boy. And she goes under the name Cesario, which is a boy's name. I got you. Okay. Chris, what were you going to say? Oh, I, I shouldn't say. All I know is that it is such a different experience for me when I read the play on my own. And then when I hear you explain it, I just think, oh my God. Well, that's... It's completely different experience. But you see, now when you read it again, you will have that experience. And and then you'll never not have it. It's because it's all there. It's in the words. It's all I'm doing is taking us back a few hundred years before modern uh, assumptions about the world and re-entering re us into Shakespeare's assumptions of the world. And once we do that, the plays just come to life. Well, yeah, I don't know about so ought to. to. Get what's going on if you just read it. I mean, can people do that without seeing what's going? I mean, without seeing it even in the rudimentary form. So let's let's say that there are several screens between us and being able to do that, um, and some of them are more serious than others. The most obvious one is that the words have changed their meanings in four hundred years. So when Shakespeare uses the word jealous, he very often doesn't mean what we mean by jealous. He means suspicious um, and so on, things, words like that. So that's one difference. A second difference and, the, and a much bigger one is what I was talking about before about the difference between a hierarchical world and a kind of egalitarian world. You could think of it as vertically versus horizontally. We think of the world as horizontal. Everybody's spread out, and we've got all these individuals, and all men are created equal. And then we have these bizarre differences, which are products of nature or nurture or the accident of birth or place or whatever. And, but they're not important. What's important is that we're all equal. So in Shakespeare's universe, and the universe that he inherited after several thousands of years of Western civilization, before uh, the romantic and, and enlightenment revolutions, we'll say, of the 18th and 19th centuries, um, that universe was hierarchical. And that meant that everybody in it had a place in a hierarchy um, intended by God. And to treat e as equals people who were not your equals. Now, the the counterweight to that is the religious tradition that says all men are brothers. And that was also believed. So 
let's say you've got a king and you've got a knight and you've got a peasant and they're all three in the same cathedral worshiping, right? And the king is sitting up in his big chair of state over there and the knight is sitting in the, these pews over here and the peasant is standing at the back. And they're all worshiping the same God and the same redemption. They're all guilty as sinners and they're all, you know, need redemption, etc. cetera. Um, and they were aware of that. But, they, but the king does not bow to the knight or the knight bow to the peasant. It's the other way around. And they expect that. And so they, they may be sinners and they may be virtuous within their realm, but to try to change realms is, is a sign of what Shakespeare would have called emulation. We think of emulation as a good thing, like you emulate someone who's great and you want to be like them and you're emulating. But he used the word to mean um, a kind of arrogance of trying to step above your station, like Malvolio, thinking that he's to be Count Malvolio. So, so that is a huge difference. And, and oftentimes characters will say things in Shakespeare's play, which in the hierarchical world make perfect sense, but in our world uh, uh, don't. And we become offended and outraged. Um, and then people say, well, you have to reinterpret Shakespeare because, you know, we now know that the world is this way instead of that way. But then they miss out on what he's really saying. So my whole effort is, let's get back to what he was really saying in his time and place and understand it. And then if you want to go away from that and <coughs> take a different position, okay, fine. You're free to do that. I'm not going to roll history back. Um, but I want people to appreciate what Shakespeare's doing in his own time. And, and when they do that, they enjoy it a lot more because he really believes in redemption. He really believes in, in uh, improvement and harmony, ultimate harmony. Um, and so happy endings that his audience were delighted by sometimes seem to us a little disturbing and bizarre and weird because it doesn't resolve the way we want it to. Of course, if he came to our time and saw some of the dramas that we show each other on movies and TV, he would say, well, who cares? What's the point of this? This is so shallow. It's just, it's just, it's like you're living in Illyria and no invasion happens. Yeah. So, so that's a, a second thing. Um, and the third thing, of course, is the whole, uh, the whole scientific revolution, which turns us into skeptics and, and um, at best, skeptics, and at worst, arrogant, and feeling that we're superior to any kind of religious believers, because we know better. We have science, we have Darwin, we have physics, you know, and astronomy and so and so and so. <clears throat> and uh, the physical world is everything and the material world is everything and, and there is no spiritual world. So all of this is just fantasizing and therefore it isn't important. And let's get back to what is important, which is either survival if you're a Darwinian or emotion if you're a romantic with no roots in the, in the moral or spiritual tradition. <clears throat> and Shakespeare is not that. Shakespeare is definitely a moralist and a, and a believer. Um, and he treats his audience as if they were, because most of them are. So, so my mission is to try to help people get back to what Shakespeare's audience would have understood his plays to be about. And then you can either like it or lump it. That's fine. <laughs> Generally, people tend to like it, like Chris. All right, let's, um, other, do you have other questions? All right, let's talk about the title of the play. <clears throat> Next week I'll do, or I mean Thursday, I'll, I'll do some more reading of scenes um, and kind of fill in some of this. But um, I'm, I'm trying to give you kind of the superstructure tonight and then and then we'll point back to it when we do some reading Thursday. Um, 
The title of the play is Twelfth Night or What You Will. End of discussion. That's the whole play right there. Except you don't know what I'm talking about, so I'm going to try to explain. <laughs> what is Twelfth Night? Twelfth Night is the twelfth day of Christmas. And it celebrates the epiphany, meaning the showing forth of Christ as the son of God to the three magi who come from the east. Um, and the magi, it, it's, it's a very interesting thing if you kind of start looking into it. Um, they are astrologers, but they're astrologers, not the kind who write in the newspaper and tell you what you want to hear uh, based on the month of your birth, but they really were, uh, or at least the composers of the New Testament believed them to be wise men of the East. Sometimes they're translated as wise men. They were astrologers in the sense that they could read in the heavens, and the heavens had meaning because people believed that God had ordained and arranged the stars in such a way that they conveyed the sense of the universe and corresponded to things on earth. So the Magi had read in the heavens because Jupiter, let's see, how did it go? Uh, Jupiter was in conjunction with Saturn in some way. Um, and Saturn was always uh, the planet that corresponded to the part of the world where the Jews lived, right? The Holy Land. Um, it's, it's maybe not accidental that our Sabbath is called Saturday, based on Saturn. And Jupiter meant kingship, because he was the king of the gods. So they studied the heavens, and they came to Judea, and they said, where is the king of the Jews? Because Jupiter and Saturn are in this particular kind of conjunction. And there's a, there's a kind of leftover implication of that in the, in the book of uh, Matthew in the New Testament. So they come to say, where is the king of the Jews? And Herod gets all upset and starts killing infants because he doesn't want anybody to uh, compromise his kingship. And they, um, they go their way and they end up in Bethlehem. The star guides them, right? The star guides them. So for the kids, we now have this star that's moving along and they're following along with their camels. But it really meant that they figured out what the stars were telling them, and they went to the right place. And so they see the Christ child, and they bring gifts, um, and they worship, and so on. And of course, all of this is um, told later, and then accreted to in the tradition, and so it, gets, it can get very complicated. But the festival, the 12th day of Christmas, celebrated that event as a revelation to human beings, wise though they might be, of the reality of the incarnation that Christians believe in, in Christ. And that is the epiphany, meaning the showing forth of the God. And it was celebrated in Europe by a kind of uh, jolly, wild, topsy-turvy festival. Everything was turned upside down. So if God becomes man, then man's relation to God changes. That's the Christian idea. And it's celebrated by turning everything upside down. So they're, so they're dancing and wildly and singing and doing all stuff all through the night. Instead of daytime festivities, they're having them at night. And instead of the king telling the the local village idiot what to do, they make the local village idiot the king for the day. And they put him on a pedestal and they do what he says as, insofar as they can. And it's, it's sort of like our Halloween now. I mean, they celebrated Halloween in a different way too, but it's, it's like anything goes, right? It's joy, it's just the overflowing of joy. Um, so that's Twelfth Night. Now, what is what you will? So Shakespeare has this middle period of comedies where he's giving them kind of throwaway titles. As you like it. All's well that ends well. What you will. Uh, 
much ado about nothing. And in this case, that's what the second part of the, the subtitle is. It's a throwaway, whatever you want. I'm going to call it Twelfth Night. You don't want to call it Twelfth Night, call it whatever you will. That's at one level. But will is a very powerful word in Shakespeare and in the time, generally, because it means several different things and they're layered. So at one level, will means man's free will, man's capacity to make choices given by God. In fact, it's God's greatest gift to man is the freedom of the will. Because by it, man can earn reward or punishment. If you didn't have a free will, you would be the victim of external forces and nothing but, right? You'd be a product of nature. You'd be nothing but a, an automaton that nature throws up and behaves the way you can't help behaving. And a lot of people believe that, <coughs> nowadays especially. But the tradition teaches that man has free will. And therefore, God can reward and punish people based on their choices. And it's just punishment. If you couldn't help what you did, it would be wrong to be punished for it. If you don't have a free will, punishment is cruel. So freedom of the will is one of the most fundamental principles. So at one level, what you will is implies that. But because it means that, it also can come to mean willfulness. The imposition of your will on the world in a place or in a way which you have no business imposing it. Like willfully cutting yourself off from the sun and the world of men in mourning your dead brother. She is imposing on reality a kind of willfulness that goes against nature. And all the Illyrians are doing this. Uh, Sir Toby is imposing on himself a drunkenness which goes against nature, goes against the happiness of his life. Uh, Orsino is doing it. Sir Andrew, they're all doing this. So, and then, because will can mean willfulness, it can also mean um, the, the, willfulness, the willfulness of the sexual desire. That is, the sexual desire can compel you. <clears throat> and so that itself is, some, is called will. You, you are indulging in your will. Um, and then there, there's another, another level of pun which Shakespeare uses in the sonnets, which doesn't really appear in the play. Um, so we won't get into that. But if you return to the title now and you see that the play's title is Twelfth Night or What You Will, so you've now got this choice. The or gives you a choice. <laughs> Your choice is to call it Twelfth Night or you can call it What You Will. But it's also what the play is about. The play is about the celebration of the epiphany, of the showing forth of the divine, whatever it is, that is revealed by the true love of true lovers, that is revealed by time, that is revealed by Festi's wisdom, on the one hand, that's Twelfth Night, or you have a choice between that and what you will, what you decide is gonna be reality, how you wanna see it, how you wanna impose your will on the world. So here's Orsino choosing to be in love with love and ignore the girl he thinks he's in love with because she's beautiful. Here's Olivia choosing to cut herself off from the world, as we said. Here's Sir Toby choosing to be drunk. Here's Sir Andrew thinking that he's, you know, smarter than he is, and thinking that eating beef is doing him harm and maybe he should stop eating beef. And here's Malvolio fantasizing about marrying uh, Olivia and being Count Malvolio and so on. And there, this is what they will. But it's wrong. It's sentimental. It's fake. It's invented. It's, it's an, a willful imposition of their fantasy on what is actual reality. Now, the invaders, 
Viola and Sebastian and Antonio, are not imposing their will on the world. They are doing the opposite. They're saying, I don't know how to solve this, so you better do it. <laughs> to time, to God, to the powers that be. And they're willing, that is, they submit their will to whatever is willed above them. And because of that, they have the stamp of authenticity and freshness and reality, and therefore they become completely irresistible, not only to the characters in the play, but to us. Why do we keep reading this play? We just love Viola, we just love her, and we love Sebastian, and we love Antonio, and we love Festi because he's, you know, trying to poke a hole in the hot air of these people and get them to wake up. So there are two kinds of people. Just as I said, there's this Illyria of sentimentality and the invaders. There are two kinds of people. There are real people, and there are people who are fooling themselves. Not fooling in the sense of the wise fool Festi, but really kidding themselves. And the only difference in the people, among the people who are fooling themselves, is um, are they capable of responding to a dose of reality when it appears? or not? Do they hold out against it or not? I mean, Sir Andrew is probably beyond redemption <laughs> in terms of waking him up to his own folly. Um, Malvolio, it's a question at the end. You know, Malvolio runs off and says, um, when it's all revealed at the end, the, uh, Festi says, <clears throat> quoting the letter, some are born great, some achieve greatness, some have greatness thrown upon them. I played Sir Topaz in this interlude. And then he makes fun of Malvolio. By the Lord, fool, I am not mad. But do you remember, madam, why laugh you at such a barren rascal? He's calling us back to what Malvolio had said about him, the fool, early in the play. And you smile not, he's gagged. And then he says, and thus the whirligig of time brings in his revenges. And Malvolio says, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. And he storms out. Well, interlude. There's a place in Hamlet where Hamlet welcomes the players to Elsinore. And he lists the various kinds of players, because each player is a type cast player. So there is <clears throat> the king, the king will have tribute, there is the lover, he shall not sigh gratis, that is, I'm going to pay him for his size as a lover. Um, there's the boy who plays the girl, who's grown a little, etc. There are these other characters. <clears throat> and then he says, uh, and the the humorous man will end his part in peace. In other words, we're not going to beat him up for being humorous. OK, what does humorous mean? There are four humors in the medieval and Renaissance physiology. Um, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. And a human being is made up of a balance of these four humors. And they are characterized by being <clears throat> either hot and moist, or hot and dry, or cold and moist, or cold and dry, like the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. <clears throat> if all the elements are balanced in you, then you can stand up and say, this is a man. This is a balanced man, as, Anton as Antony says about Brutus at the end of Julius Caesar. But the humorous man has an excess of a humor, a little too much of one of them. So what does that result in? If you have too much blood, you end up being kind of fat, red, roly-poly, jolly, like Santa Claus. Or like Sir John Falstaff. If you have too much phlegm, you are phlegmatic, boring, dull, witless. If you have too much black bile, you're going to be melancholic. That's what melancholia means. Black, melon, black, colia, bile, or collar. 
and, that, and so you're going to be miserable and depressed and happy. <clears throat> and if you have too much yellow bile, then you, are, you just have choler. That's choleric, meaning you fly off the handle. You fly into tempers. You get angry quickly. You change moods fast. So the balanced man has all these in harmony. Now, we can make fun of this as a physiology, but uh, if, you, if you imagine, say, getting a shot of adrenaline, does it change your mood? Do you become a different kind of person? Yeah. Or testosterone, or uh, estrogen, or any of the other substances that influence us. I mean, the steroid cured my back. I don't know what it did to my psyche. <laughs> but um, <coughs> it's, not, it's, it's the same kind of science. It's just that we're a little bit better at it and a little more subtle and complicated. But it's, it's not a completely foreign idea. In any case, the humorous man is the one who has one of these excesses. And in Shakespearean comedies, there is often a man, in addition to there being a fool, and of course a lover and so on, there is often a humorous man. In As You Like It, it's Jaques, he's the melancholy man. And in this play, it's Malvolio. And of course, we're playing uh, his choleric elements and his, his um, I mean, he's not, got, he's not sanguine. Like, he's not cheerful and roly-poly and Santa Claus. He, he tends toward being choleric, but also towards being um, less witty than the fool, let's say. So maybe a little bit phlegmatic. But he also has, he's also named Malvolio, so it's not just about his about the humors in him, it's about his will, too. <clears throat> but in any case, he runs off saying, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. And in Hamlet, Hamlet says, the humorous man shall end his role in peace. So what happens here? The Duke says, pursue him and entreat him to a peace. This play is written probably just before Hamlet. <laughs> pursue him and entreat him to a peace. They're going to chase after Malvolio and beg him to make peace with everybody, to come back. You had a role in it. They did you wrong. That's true. But on the other hand, you kind of asked for it. So let's all be friends. And we don't know whether he is going to be persuaded or not. Shakespeare doesn't tell us. But he shows Orsino trying to win him back, trying to make peace. And so that's the... That's the um, intentional, or the intended harmony at the end that extends even to the humorous man, even to the extreme Malvolio. And uh, by the way, revenge is always wrong in Shakespeare. The only play in which revenge has any positive possible connotation is in Hamlet, and the whole play is about the meaning of revenge. Um, and it's a tragedy because Hamlet goes wrong and indulges in a kind of revenge he hasn't been called to enact. But that was last year's lecture. <laughs> um, the point is here that, that when Malvolio says, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you, he is conveying to us his Malvolio, right? His bad will. With all this happiness and joy and reunion and marriage going on, he just runs off wanting revenge. So that's not good. But the Duke's going to try to turn him around. OK, I want to finish with the song, and then I'll take questions. Um, Festy comes forward at the end and sings a song. And it kind of sums up the play, in a way. When that I was, and a little tiny boy, with a hey-ho, the wind and the rain. Sorry? You're at the very end of the play, the last speech of the play. It's the epilogue, or it's actually the end of Act 5, Scene 1. Got it? Yep. When that I was and a little tiny boy, with a hey-ho, the wind and the rain, a foolish thing was but a toy, for the rain it raineth every day. But when I came to man's estate, with hey-ho, the wind and the rain, Gainst knaves and thieves, men shut their gate, for the rain it raineth every day. 
But when I came alas to wive with hey ho the wind and the rain, by swaggering could I never thrive, for the rain it raineth every day. But when I came unto my beds with hey ho the wind and the rain, with toss pot still had drunken heads, for the rain it raineth every day. A great while ago the world begun with hey ho the wind and the rain, but that's all one, our play is done, and we'll strive to please you every day. Now it's time for you to clap, because that's the end of the play. We'll strive to please you every day. All right, a great while ago the world begun with wind and rain. What does this mean? When I was a little boy, a foolish thing was but a toy. If you're being foolish as a kid, it doesn't cost much. It's a toy. It's insignificant. A toy doesn't mean just something that a child plays with. It means an insignificant nothing. So it's all right to be foolish if you're a child. You're not doing too much damage to yourself or anyone else. But when I came to man's estate, against knaves and thieves, men shut their gate. Knaves and thieves are bad men. They're not just children. It's not just toys now. When you're being selfish as a child, you're not going to do a lot of damage, but you need to be corrected. But if you grow up uncorrected and become a knave or a thief, People are going to shut their gates against you. You're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to be part of the harmony. For the rain, it raineth every day. Okay, but when I came alas to wife, time to marry, by swaggering could I never thrive. What does swaggering mean? Being arrogant, Being arrogant right? Putting yourself above your station. Okay, so... Who's swaggering here? Well, obviously Malvolio, to be Count Malvolio. But also Orsino. I don't need to go talk to Olivia. I'm just going to sit here being in love with love. Well, how does that work out for him? <laughs> or Olivia. I'm not, I don't have to worry about the passage of time and my beauty getting lost. I'm just going to mourn for my dead brother for seven years. No, that's not going to work. So by swaggering, you can't thrive. Thrive is the verb from which we get our word thrift. It means to succeed, to do well, to, to achieve something. You can't do it by swaggering. And not only not by swaggering like walking around and saying, I'm bigger than you are, but swaggering in every sense, including the moral sense. And then, but when I came unto my beds, with toss pots still had drunken heads. What's a toss pot? You know, someone who tosses a pot of ale into himself. So what is a drunken head? Okay, so obviously he's saying if you drink a lot, you're going to get drunk. Yeah, but that's not the point. Or that's not the only point. The deeper point is, what is a drunken head? The head of a fool, right? The head of, of somebody not living happily ever after. So it's not until, for example, that, that Sir Toby Belch gets over the drink that he realizes, oh, I really need to marry Mariah. This, this is a good match. So what is this rain that raineth every day? <sighs> okay, this is why I love Shakespeare so much. It's two things at once. It's the same rain, but it's two things at once. It's the rain that rains on your parade when your parade is a parade of swaggering or arrogance or self-will. In other words, it's nature rebelling against your fantasy and your egotism and your sentimentality. But it's also the rain of grace. It's the gift, it's the reward of the virtuous. The rain of God's grace on the world because the rain comes down from heaven and feeds us, right? We don't live without the rain growing the crops. So the rain, it raineth every day. Every day we're having this opportunity of grace, this opportunity of kindness and harmony and joy. And every day we're being punished for our swaggering, for our self-will, for our unkindness, for our, our humorous extravagances. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's what happens when you get Shakespeare. You go, oh, man, wow. <laughs> How does he do this? Exactly. 
All right, we have about uh, eight minutes, so ask me questions now. And next week, I, I promise I'll read more of the play and we'll, we'll talk about specific things. And if you have particular questions about speeches or scenes that you want to talk about, bring those to me because we'll, we'll have some time to, to look at those. But uh, I wanted to give you a kind of overview today. So, questions? Okay, fair enough. I did like the cakes of ale. You did. <laughs> so it's a wonderful moment because um, Sir Toby says to Malvolio, dost thou think because thou art virtuous there shall be no more cakes and ale? <laughs> What's wonderful about it is it's working in both directions. <laughs> so Malvolio's virtue is, uh, is put on, right? It's a kind of fake virtue. Um, and Sir Toby is popping the air out of his balloon. Like, uh, come on. The world is the world, and there's going to be cakes and ale, and people are going to have fun, whether you pretend to be virtuous or not. So it punctures the balloon of Malvolio. But at the very same time, for us, the audience, we go, Sir Toby, do you think that's all life is about, is cakes and ale? Like, do you think because you're enjoying cakes and ale, virtue doesn't matter? <laughs> you know, it works exactly inverted as well. And Malvolio's been yelling at him. Well, he's not the one to correct Sir Toby, uh, because he's too far in the other direction himself. So they're both living in their fantasy world. But it's funny when they clash, because they're both shedding, each is shedding light on the, the foolishness of the other. No. Well, you oughtn't. <laughs> Let me tell you. It's just every single thing I see on the screen is so pointless. It, it, it just defies description. You're only discovering this now? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's just reached this point where, I, and you don't realize how much how it zaps you, even if you don't watch it, even if you then turn it, just really zaps you. And so being in, in, in this moment, it just makes my, it's sort of like meeting authenticity. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. And I, I don't want to say there's no authenticity in our time. There is. There are great works. Not, but it, the culture is at war with it um, in many, many respects. And so it makes Shakespeare the more precious. Oh, <laughs>